uh, the last two weeks felt like two years or more in terms of the amount of demand and activity that Blanche and I were experiencing way beyond our normal day-to-day -day life. Uh, much of it involved, as you know, uh, going to New York to buy a house, which we did. Trying to deal with all of the things that go around buying a house, like talking to contractors, uh, um, figuring out what fits in the house and what doesn't fit in the house, learning the town, uh, it, it, on and on. Everything about it was new. Everything was new. And, uh, and in some ways challenging and in some ways quite wonderful. And I bring that all up because Much of what I'm doing here is perceived of and presented as a spiritual teaching. So what does that have to do with buying a house or selling a house or two houses and <laughs> all of what we're doing? Well, I, I refer really to Rudy's line, this is your spiritual life. It's not somehow removed, it's not somehow elevated, separated, transcending of this. It is this. And when your life is being uprooted from its norms, when things are changing in very big and fundamental ways, you have to draw on something to make it possible to maintain some kind of grace while this is going on. It will not always be possible. But it is something Rudy called work. The work of spiritual life is to take the tensions and the dramas of day-to-day -day existence and transform them into something greater or higher or more noble, if you will more real. And this last few weeks has been a level of profound teaching for me. And, and not always uh, what you would call benign or holy. <laughs> it was a lot of work. I'm grateful that I have work. I'm grateful that Rudy taught me ways of being in the world that allow you to go through times that are challenging. We all have wonderful times where life is predictable and knowable and we go through our day-to-day -day life in a way that is uh, not all that hard. You get up, have breakfast, go to work, do your work, come home, have dinner, watch TV, go to bed, year upon year upon year, and it's fairly easy. Yes, things go wrong. The car runs out of gas. The television doesn't work. I mean, things happen in life, but the big changes, the upheavals that can happen in life are, are always possible, but not always happening. But I will tell you, as you move toward the end of your life, they will be more available. Things will start to happen. And so I sit here almost weekly and document a journey that may be for you in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. It may serve you now and it may not serve you at all. <laughs> and um, I always say to people, if this doesn't speak to you, find something that does. But great lessons occurred to me this week that I want to share with you because I think they work at all times. One is that I was having a very difficult <clears throat> process trying to figure out how to live in this new space. 
how to leave the comfort zone that I have been in for so many years, how to become a different person, how to let go of all of these things and people that I love, including every one of you, how to move on. It's not exactly dying, although it feels very similar, I think. And so as you move through this process, you are kind of looking for signals, signs, guidances that help you move through. And what was happening in this trip, which was so sweet and so beautiful, is that those signs come unbidden in the subtlest and simplest of ways, and either you're paying attention or you're not. Here was the big one. We're at the airport flying to New York. I am not in the most content of moods. A woman walks toward me with a t-shirt and it says, God exists, relax. <laughs> <coughs> that became the mantra of my entire trip. It was amplified one afternoon by someone quoting a no, very well-known line, um, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> that was enough to carry me through this entire journey. Every time there was a lack of relaxation that came to mind, and this idea that God exists, however you think of God, however that word works for you, I will tell you that I have never had a problem with the word or the concept or the magnitude of possibility that the word God it means for me. I have never had a problem personalizing it, even though I know it is something bigger than personal. But I know it also manifests within the personal and can manifest on a t-shirt on a woman walking through the airport. <laughs> My early LSD experiences, which I have talked about before, showed me one thing, that we live in a multi-dimensional universe and that the plane of existence most of us inhabit is minuscule compared to where we truly are. The vastness of what we inhabit is so massive, so beyond comprehension on any level. And you can call that infinite time-space continuum, this loving, indifferent, wildly personal connection to something so beyond us, whatever you want to call it. I find the word God works very well. I know that I, this Bruce guy, is wildly connected to the God principle, to the God manifestation. And I know it has a direct line to my personal day-to-day, -day, moment to moment, minuscule, unimportant activity. And as much as it does to my larger awareness that I am walking through holy terrain at any moment. Knowing that was a gift of a drug, of LSD in the 1960s. I could not sustain that knowledge without taking the drug more, but that seemed to me to be not the way to go. What the drug did was open me to a doorway to an awareness that I discovered had been addressed by multitudes of spiritual traditions over the course of history. They all described exactly what I was talking about, exactly what I had seen. As you may recall from my endless repeating of my own story, what was told to me after the LSD trip, when I asked why I came back to this level of reality, was tell people what you saw. That was my entire injunction. 
That was exactly what I was told to do. And that's what I have been doing for my entire life, in one way or another. It's why I continue to talk to you, because I was told to do that, to share this ride, for better or for worse. And I do that. The other thing that was given to me after that experience and beginning to travel around the world looking for the teaching and the teacher that could sustain that kind of awareness and not finding anybody on my year and a half trip through Asia and Europe and looking and looking and meeting people. But as you all know the story, I returned to America and I discovered four blocks from where I lived this man Rudy. And Rudy was a teacher. And the thing that happened with Rudy, which I find so phenomenal, is I would sit with him and he would look at me and this multi-dimensional awareness expanded. I would look at him and I was no longer simply in day-to-day -day reality. I was touching something that went deeper and higher at the same time and it opened me up. It opened my mind. It opened my heart. It opened my ability to speak to people, which I was been told is what I was supposed to do. It opened my gut, which told me how to kind of intuit my way through the world. It opened this sexual space, which was really about recreation and rebirth and renewal. And it opened the base of my spine that allowed these energies to go up and over and circulate through me, and it allowed all of these centers to start to become integrated and whole, and I felt more and more like a whole person. After 44 or so years of doing this practice, long after Rudy was gone, finding that it still nurtured me, it still opened me to a multi-dimensional universe, something happened and I thought I had failed, that I hadn't gotten there. I, I didn't know what there was, but I felt I hadn't arrived, and I stopped sitting. And again, forgive me, I know this is old information, but within two weeks of giving up trying to be open and available and cosmically a, a, awake, let's say, the doors of the world that surrounded me fell away and there was the, that massiveness of being and I was a tiny instrument in the middle of it. It was just vast. And like I've said before, I thought I had arrived at something. Bruce had become a minuscule part of something great, which I already knew, but this was now like the new reality. But every so often, this thing called bruising would arise, which would become very egoistic, very about me, the biological, the physical person. And I would feel pain, and I would feel fear and anxiety. I knew a lot of it was genetic because I come from a family of warriors and it sounds like warriors, but it's warriors. <laughs> I, I come from a family of anxiety-ridden human beings. And I know I have inculcated much of that in my system. And I would feel I am this vast thing and I am this worrying thing simultaneously. And I didn't know quite how to be that. And then I would experience, and this would happen once a year specifically, and today is the day where it happens, the day of Easter the day of resurrection, the day when God's only begotten son, according to a very, very important religious tradition, Christianity, faced his own de demise and feared it in the way I fear my own loss of self, my own change in sort of removal from the world of familiar comforting forms. He stood in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, please take this away from me. But they did not. And the universe put him through what it puts us all through, our own kinds of personal crucifixions, if you will. And like Christ on the cross, we will all feel abandoned. 
for a moment. And then grace. Grace. I don't know where grace comes from other than the very source of being itself. I don't know why it's withheld, but it is. And when it returns, it becomes forgive them for they know not what they do. And you feel transcendent of the person you have been, that the walls that are closing in are now falling away again, and you feel an increased openness that you never knew was possible. I don't know if this is a repetitive pattern or if it's a singular thing that goes on, but I know that I go through these periods of great contraction and in periods of profound loss, change, transformation, alteration, I, I ask them to take this cup from my lips. And what they do, they, the plural of the singular God form, the universe itself, what it does is it sends a woman walking through the mall with a t-shirt saying, God exists, relax. And that is a lesson I have been working on waking up to my entire life. That is a message one needs to hear. It can't just go walk past you and you go, huh, that's fine. That is not the reaction you're looking for. That is to miss it entirely. It comes at you that fast and that unimportantly. You can look at this woman. She was a large woman. She had big breasts. She had this message pasted on her breasts. And you can, I mean, you can get very caught up in the breasts or <laughs> you can find the message or both. But the message came through. And Blanche and I had a really um, remarkable week in the house, making it our house. We went out and bought card table chairs and a table which we could not figure out how to open. But we've got four chairs and we placed them in every room of the house, one after another, and just sat down in each room and said, this is how it will feel to sit in our home. We brought in the security guys. We brought in the man who built the house to tell us how to turn things on and turn things off and make things work. Blanche has a horse that she's bringing. We went to one place which was about five minutes away the first woman we talked to said she would love to take Blanche's horse it was like such a gift all these little things kept happening we went to the supermarket that we knew for many years ago when we lived in that area that Blanche hated because they had no organic anything now every other thing is organic they had everything we shop for sitting there except for I love three twins ice cream <laughs> I thought there's no chance in the world that I will find three twins ice cream but I googled it and they have it at the Rhinebeck health food store <laughs> exactly what I want and need everything started to appear there and it was like little voices saying it's going to be okay relax 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 of course some bigger things occur some problems in selling the house in Los Angeles. I won't go into all of it, but it turns out that our garage is not as structurally sound as we thought it was, and there's some mold we didn't know was there, and the people want to pay us much less money than we thought we, we, uh, we, we were going to be getting, which will affect what we can do with the house in New York. And, you know, the drama, the drama of human life comes in, and it really grabs you. It really grabs you, and you... And I, and I, you know, I thought, oh, this is really hard. This is really painful. We're not going to be able to do all the things that I want to do. And this little voice kept coming back. God exists. Relax. Not having an ability to hear. Not having an ability to to know God when God is present makes life difficult. It really removes you. It removes you in a profound way from the support and the grace and the joy of being human. And that is a terrible sadness. When people live a life where they have not learned to tune in to the higher possibilities of their day, 
They live in a very narrow spectrum of what is. It is okay. It's where most people inhabit their lives. It doesn't have many highs. It doesn't have many lows, perhaps, or maybe more lows than highs. But when you start to open to the multidimensional truth of God in your life, this is a whole other experience than what many other people are going through. It has poetry and drama. It has mythic aspect. It has symphonic value. It's a, it's a remarkable way to go. It does other things. I have always been relatively calm and even tempered to the extent that Blanche's and my um, couples therapist says, don't you ever fight? <laughs> don't you ever get angry at each other? And I've always, we've always done this thing and, of keeping it quiet. My mother and father were the same way, except my mother and father, rather than fight, my mother just wouldn't talk to him for a week. And you never knew something was going on, really. It just was absolutely quiet. But, and Blanche and I, too, we have a way of just pulling back. In the last, however long it's been since this whole thing has been going on with the disruption in our lives, I have found access to anger. I tell you that because part of me wants to hide that. It wants to tell you that I'm smooth as a... As a, as a as a, what's smooth and like the piece of paper. <laughs> I, that has not happened. I have become eruptive in my feelings, and I have discovered that I can express them very vividly. And I've discovered that Blanche has the same ability. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and we really can go at it which is proving to be one of the healthiest things that's ever happened in our marriage. It is really bizarre, but it is so real and so open and so honest and so dynamic and interactive that when it calms down, which it usually does because Blanche calms down first, when it calms down, we find ourselves um, holding hands in a way that is deeper and more touching than it has been before. There is a sense of we're in this together. We're on this journey together. And there's a kind of joy and beauty and fear because we're getting old and we're starting to see that kind of we're all we have. And at one point, one of us was going to be without the other. And that's becoming very vivid. I wrote to our couples therapist the other day to wish her a happy birthday. And she wrote me back and said, Thank you, I've never been more terrified in my entire life. <laughs> because she is aware that at the age of 77, you can count the years that remain. Six years, eight years. It's a shock to the system, and that's kind of what we're going through. We are going through this movement toward the end. The Garden of Gethsemane. It is not totally pretty, but we are going to make it as nice as we can make it for the time that we have. And all of this that I'm describing, which sounds like day-to-day real-world stuff, is really, um, I'll say, softened, imbued by, uplifted by years of spiritual sitting in multidimensional space. I know people who just fight all the time. And there's nothing transcendent about it. It's just ugly and awful. And it's really scary to watch. I know people who never express their true feelings. I know people who haven't even gotten to fear yet or who have, haven't gotten to the fact that life has duration. And maybe meaning and content and who knows, some kind of evaluation. That life is, for many people, 
not even a question mark. It's just, it's, it's, it's life. This is life. It's life. You hear that all the time. Oh, it's just life. I never have understood that. What is life? That is for all my entire time on earth. What is this? And I have zero answer for it, except it's so much bigger than what we know it to be. It's so much bigger than our uh, physiological sensory mechanisms will allow us to know. But there is something in it that breaks up, open your head in a way, your brain cells, and allows you to go, and you don't know what you're seeing, but you know you're seeing it. And the people who are given over to that process, the beauty of that process, know that God exists. They know it. That's what they, that's what they call it. They don't have other words for it. They don't always have a Buddhist ideal that dismisses that word. It's called God for them. And for those people, they walk around with t-shirts that say, God exists, relax. So, we're facing, you, you all know this story, I'm, I'm sorry, this is getting so boring, but we're facing, you know, we're having, we're installing a gallery show next week. God knows why in the middle of all this we're installing a gallery show that will open on uh, May 4th. Um, we're flying back to Los Angeles next week. We have to pack up that house. We have to pack up this house. We have to help my son pack up his house. We're transferring two families with three houses worth of goods to, to New York. The day-to-day -day demand of that is so much beyond what 76-year-old people, 75, but almost 76, people experience. And... The only way to do it, the only way to do it is relax. And relax means come into play with what is right now. Sit still, do what's given, open, take care of it, do the thing in front of you well, and it will be done. Move on to the next and the next and the next, and at some point, it's done. Somewhere in some future, all of this is over. Something else is completely new and has arisen. It's called rebirth. Resurrection. This is Easter. Easter allows us to remember resurrection on so many personal and historical levels. Resurrection is the great promise of human life. How you deal with that, what you make of it, whether it's a story you tell yourself or a myth you believe in or a reality that you actually live every day, that's kind of your call. But a real spiritual life brings you into touch with death and rebirth every day. And the best way to deal with it is to go right into the heart of every moment you're in and let everything that was fall away and everything that will be arrive when it wants to. Meanwhile, you are right here, have always been here, and will always be here, and that which dies is reborn into that which will be. And it will arrive in this very space of your being. And if you're open, big-hearted, loving, and available, honest and real, it will be transformative, uplifting, renewing, reviving, and ultimately, it will give you an endless sense of rebirth in this universe over and over and over. The promise of that came from Christ. The promise of that comes from just sitting in your own heart and seeing that it's true. So go into your heart. Find your way into this space because it's a doorway into the infinite. Find a way into stillness that allows you to penetrate the density of emotionality the density of hard-heartedness and fear and all of those things. Allow yourself to relax that part of your being, relax it deeply, enter inside, and you will be renewed by that faith and that experience over and over. 
And when you're not allowed to be renewed, it's only because they're taking you to a different level and you're going to go through a real sense of help me, I need help, and it will come from another dimension. We're all on a big ride. We're all on a big ride. Some people know it, some people don't. You who are listening to this, who are sitting here now, know that you're on it or you wouldn't be here. You, you know that there's more to life than whatever it is you think it is. You know, it's not playing golf. It's not about that. So I share all this with you, hoping that it documents on some small level a personal journey of a seeker and his wife, another seeker, moving toward an unknown that is truly bigger and more demanding than we have been exposed to before, willing to know that it represents something that is more ending than anything else. I mean, it's easier to make changes when you're moving to an, a new beginning, but when you're moving to a, a new ending, that's different. And the, finding the grace to do that, maybe, maybe these talks will give you some guidance along the way. And if not, what can I say? Anyway, love to you all. Um, next week, we're in LA, back here the week after, and we will continue this for as long as we're here. Any questions? I have nothing but questions. But <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I won't bother you with them, <laughs> but uh, I really deeply am grateful that you guys show up. It allows something to emerge and possibly to take root, and, uh, and I get notes from people who are listening, who people I've never met, for whom some of these words have proven to be meaningful. So for whatever reason or for whoever you are that needs to hear this, thank you for listening. <laughs>